Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to Open Hour. I'm really, really excited about this month's topic. Um, we're having this open hour on environmental monitoring methods and um, recognized by enforcement bodies. Um, so this conversation has been happening in a lot of different places on Public Lab. Um, some of us were talking about it a little bit at our annual barn raising event, um, which happened just this past uh, November. Um, and others of us have been talking, um, talking a little bit about it online just in terms of exploring what um, what currently exists in terms of reference methods that like the EPA puts out there um, and other people thinking a little bit about how to make tools or um, environmental monitoring methods match up to some of those that are sort of standardized by right, um, some of the larger regulatory agencies right now. So um, Open Hour is, um, for those who haven't been on before, it's a um, really open open <laughs> time, um, unstructured for, with basically just the idea that we can all share this space um, to learn from each other and engage about the topic, um, put some faces out there and really sort of share um, questions, things that we want to learn about, um, things that we're interested in exploring relating to the topic. So while there are all kinds of questions that we can ask about this and we Sort of set it up in that way. It's also just really great um, to, to learn, sort of let this flow naturally and um, see where see where this takes us. So I'd love to go around and do um, some introductions just to learn a bit about who's in the room here. And um, just for a heads up, this conversation is recorded. So I know we have a couple um, people from federal agencies on the line right now. So if there's anything you need to say in terms of being recorded or anything like that, um, your introduction time is a great space to do that. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm really excited about everyone here and I'm looking forward to the open hour. So um, just to start off introductions, I'm not sure if everyone's seeing the same screen I am, but um, Allison, I actually have you in the top corner. So if I loop around for intros, you, you are first. Are you okay with that? Do you wanna say where you are, um, who you are, and what your interest in the topic is? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Parker. I can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Thanks. Um, I am an ORISE fellow at the Environmental Protection Agency, so I'm a, a fellow um, here. I'm not a federal employee, so as you mentioned, thank you for the reminder. Um, I want to say that I'm not speaking for EPA, so speaking for myself only. Mm -hmm. um, so my fellowship here is focused on citizen science and thinking about how EPA can really integrate citizen science methods and thinking about um, uh, both thinking about e uh, citizen science for EPA research, so EPA scientists leading projects, and then also thinking about policies to support the integration of citizen science um, into all of EPA's work, including regulation and enforcement. Um, and so Shannon suggested me for this call because I've recently been working with her and the National Advisory Council for Environmental Policy and Technology on a new report that will be coming out on December 13th that is advice and recommendations, advice and recommendations. to EPA on how um, they can integrate citizen science into the work of EPA. So I can talk about that report. My experience isn't so much technical, more in the, in the thinking about how we can um, or how EPA might go about um, recognizing more federal methods or, or thinking about how to integrate citizen science more fully. Thanks. Awesome, great, thank you. Um, yeah, in the lineup, I'm, I'm next here. Um, so my name is Stevie Lewis and um, I work with Public Lab in the New Orleans area. Um, and I do a lot with um, outreach and thinking about ways in which um, community science and everyone can share a little bit about that um, on public lab but I'm particularly interested in this topic because some of the things that we have a lot of people have been thinking about um, are you know the federal me me methods for monitoring a lot of things are um, really challenging or prohibitively expensive so I'm um, trying to think a little bit about ways in which communities can engage in that process that's what I'm particularly interested in here um, Rachel are you are you good to go Rochelle. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, this is Rochelle Duval, and I am a scientist at uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency over in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And um, I have been working in the area of federal reference and equivalent methods for the past three years or so, and also low-cost sensors and um, understanding the performance of sensors, testing them in science applications, so a variety of different activities um, we've been working on in the past couple of years. And I just want to say any comments I have, any uh, anything that I may express, my personal opinions don't necessarily express. Them. But they're my opinions only. And um, sorry, I'm can you say that? If, if you fade it out just there, can you just say that again? Um, last part. Yeah, just that last part. Where you fade it out. Okay, I'm going to have to pick up the phone for a second. I think I'm having some trouble here with my speakerphone. Um, I am a federal employee, so any of the opinions that I express, um, anything I have to say is my own personal opinion. It may not necessarily reflect what the agency's opinions are. Great. Awesome. Um, and sorry for your name, <laughs> Michelle. I see it now. Oh, no, that's okay. No problem. Um, Gretchen. Hi, my name is Gretchen Gerke, and I work with Public Lab. Um, I'm a uh, data quality and advocacy manager there. Uh, so similar to Stevie, a lot of my interests lie um, in, you know, hoping that we can work with, um, working with communities with low cost methods that actually will have um, impacts that will benefit those communities um, beyond, you know, what a community might uh, be able to uh, orchestrate for themselves and really like seek out some of that like um, some authority in in their in their data also or, or build partnerships um, based on some of their low cost monitoring uh, that would you know that that, that could inspire um, or demand uh, uh, you know more established methods uh, follow up. So um, that's a lot of my interest in this, and then also. Um, I guess as some of the, some of my personal background. I used to work at EPA as a um, postdoctoral uh, research scientist, and so um, uh, have some you know familiarity with the um, uh, with the I guess the responsibilities that are um, inherent in that, and so um, just understanding a lot of the liability aspects of of, of you know. Um, new methods that are not, you know, fully fleshed out the way a federal or reference method might be. Um, and so kind of interested in, in this balance, I guess. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Brian, are you around? Okay, we can come back. Um, Liz? Hey, um, I'm Liz. I'm Director of Community Development here at Public Lab, and I'm calling in from Brooklyn, New York. And thanks everyone for being speakers today. I'm really excited about it. Great. Um, Matthew, you're next to my lineup if you're good to go. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Matthew. I work at Public Lab um, in the Portland, uh, Oregon office. And I've um, been working with Stevie and Gretchen for a number of years on a project to monitor frac sand. Um, I come from a design background um, and I'm interested in how we can make uh, tools that not just meet these data quality options, but that um, meet them regularly. And um, I'm really concerned about the uh, field deployment and uh, field use of equipment. So. Okay. ClimateX speaker two. <laughs> is... Jeff, is that you? I think you're muted. Yeah, I, I somehow, that got stuck on my Zoom instance, and now I, I have never been able to figure out how to delete that. But I'm Jeff Warren. <laughs> um, I work at Public Lab also. And uh, yeah, I've been uh, eagerly reading and learning about uh, things like Method 9 for direct visual observation uh, of smoke and so forth uh, from other people on this, uh, on this call uh, and their posts. And uh, I guess, I, I, I don't know if it's within the scope of the call, but I'm, I'm really curious about how something like uh, method nine comes to be where it's just like, hey, you can look at things. Uh, let's make a method on based on that, you know, um, and or you can take pictures of things. Let's make a method based on that. Uh, so, yeah, that's sort of my interest. Great. Um, Brian, I jumped over you. Uh, you stepped away. Do you want to do a brief intro where you are, who you are, what got you to the call today? 
Uh, yeah, for some reason I thought there was a second Brian on, so I was a little confused. For <laughs> gotcha. But no, I, that, that was why I stepped away because you skipped over me and I was a bit uh, <laughs> so I wanted to give you the opportunity to give me this chance to, to say hello to everybody. No, I'm teasing. Um, good good uh, morning, afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in this, in this, in this world. Um, I'm Brian Butler. I'm the Community Outreach uh, Director for Air Alliance Houston um, in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'll give you the, eleva the elevator pitch. We're um, Houston's leading public health nonprofit focused on air quality. Our, our three core areas are um, research, advocacy, and um, education. And um, so, so what, what folks are doing, what you guys are doing in public lab, everyone on the, is so near and dear. And I mean, the amount of inter intersections of our work, I think, um, speaks for themselves. And so um, just one quick little thing. I'm just so excited. I, I'm sure you all are of what is happening with the, the, the local pipeline. I think there's a lot of us that were just excited about that. And I mean, I think it's just good to acknowledge it because that really encourages us to continue to do what we're doing. I mean, for them to like move that whole piece the way that they did, I mean, that was just uh, public pressure. I mean, I don't know, someone tell me something I don't know, but it seemed like public pressure was really the thing that moved the needle. So um, we should all be doing that, you know what I mean? If that's what's working. So anyways, uh, thank you all for, um, Give me a chance to speak, and I just want to sit back and listen and get all the good information you guys have. Great, thanks, guys. Um, Shannon, S -I -C -I -C, are you available to unmute and say hello? Okay, we can. Hi. <laughs> there we go. All right, is that working? Yes. <clears throat> okay, good. Um, yeah, this is Shannon Hicks. I'm a research engineer at the Stroud Water Research Center um, outside of Philadelphia. <laughs> and I am an uh, electrical engineer and I build a variety of uh, electronic devices and uh, low cost uh, uh, data and sensors and, uh, and, and hardware and things like that. And uh, I'm also involved in a variety of uh, citizen science um, uh, collection uh, programs where we're uh, using our low cost methods to um, uh, we have a variety of people collecting data from around the world, so uh, we're curious as to the validity of uh, you know those measurements and, and how it can be used by regulatory agencies. Now that some of our data is starting to get picked up on the radar of certain agencies and, and groups, so uh, I'm curious to hear what the other people have to share. Great, thanks. Um, Jet, are you able to unmute and say hello? Okay, that's fine. We can come back to you if you if you find you're available. Um, calling in from the phone. Thank you, um, Chris. Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm a student at North Carolina State University, and I'm working with um, extraterrestrial projects um, in research near uh, the American Tobacco Campus, working on a prairie. Uh, research prairie island and doing biodiversity assays but um, the reason I'm interested in public labs is it's an awesome mechanism and connector and um, for me to be able to talk with my peers and um, my uh, different students and not only as a, an aspiring scientist but also as a citizen scientist to um, talk about different environmental issues and like you said the social pressure um, I think is is a mechanism if it's uh, armed with uh, the science and the data to back it because that makes us all the more mighty. So I love to learn from you guys what, about what I can do as a citizen and a scientist. Great. Um, so I'm just going to try to bump these real quick because we're already almost 15 minutes in. So many great people on. Um, but just your name, where you're calling in from, and what specifically brought you to this call today. Tara May. I think you're on mute. Nope, we still can't hear you. Okay, do you wanna write in comments? Um, there's a chat feature right there. Perfect. Okay, Renate, are you around? Are you on mute or can you hear us? Uh, are you talking to me? 
Uh, Renata. Renata, sorry. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Huh, that's okay, no worries. Renata, can you hear? I think you're on mute. Oh, okay. I, okay, I got it. Thank you. Uh, I'm calling in from New Orleans. I'm really pretty new to this. I'm uh, working with the uh, Louisiana Bucket Brigade that is monitoring uh, air in our petrochemical industry here in Louisiana. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I've just dialed in to learn what y'all doing. Great, thank you. Um, David, are you available? David Mack? Uh, David Mack? Oh yes. yeah, um, so my name is David, Mac David McIntosh. Um, I actually work for EPA Region 1 in uh, Boston. Um, same disclaimer applies. I'm a staff engineer, so my, my opinions are my own and not EPA or policy. Um, so I, I've been following Public Lab for a while, and um, I, I actually didn't know about today's call until about an hour ago when it popped up in my calendar. Mm -hmm. So just interested to hear what people have to say. Thanks. Sure. Thanks for joining. Uh, a. Clements, are you available to unmute? Hi, my name is Andrea, and I'm a new employee at EPA. Um, I joined to work on low-cost sensors for air quality research. Um, my background, I've done a lot of work um, trying to measure air quality in a lot of different places across the U.S., and um, have had experience working with uh, citizen scientists and also have, have observed the need to um, deploy more sensors for kind of um, targeted um, field campaigns and such like that. So um, I'm interested to hear what everyone is interested in and hopefully we can share some great stuff. Awesome. Um, Dan, are you available? Oh, we're having a hard time hearing you. Still no. Okay, <laughs> do you wanna write in the chat? Um, I think you can do, you can write in who you are, where you're calling in from, and what brought you in to the call today, if that's not working. Um, Claudia? Um, hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Claudia Martinez Mansell. I work in one of, well, supporting one of the local community committees in a refugee camp in Lebanon. And we did the balloon mapping and it was a great success. So I'm very curious to learn of other techniques um, and methods because I'm sort of very always worried that things are expensive and time consuming. So I think it's very important to, to know what works and doesn't before trying to work with a community on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andre, are you there? Okay, um, and then we have a couple call-in users. Does anybody want to give a hello where you're calling in from and what brought you here today? Uh, hello, my name is Andre. I'm from Brazil, and I discover uh, this public uh, lab on internet. I right now I'm I'm doing a uh, research about a collaborative sensors. Uh, it's from my master degree, so. I discovered this incredible uh, thing that you are doing, guys. So I think this will be a great help for my research and a great first step to, to start my research. So uh, this is why I'm here. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else? Last hellos? Okay, great. Um, really excited everyone's here. I think um, just to sort of kick off conversations um, a little bit about this topic, one question that I have is, um, can anybody feed in a little bit of information about um, methods that are recognized by enforcement bodies and how do those methods become recognized? I can speak on that for EPA's side. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so um, we have um, specifically for our national ambient air quality standards, um, this is uh, part of regulations and we set standards for um, six criteria pollutants. So this is the ozone, NO2, um, sulfur dioxide, PM, lead, and carbon monoxide. So there's six criteria pollutants. 
And um, specifically for these, we um, have designated methods called the federal reference and equivalent methods. Uh, there are two different types of methods. Um, one is a designated method for each of those criteria pollutants that says this is the method that needs to be used. These are the testing criteria and what have you. And um, then there's the federal equivalent methods and those are um, designed to allow more innovation. Um, different uh, technologies that come up um, can um, submit applications for this um, program. And again, they go through a strict testing protocol um, before they can be designated. So once um, those are actually, a company would submit an application to EPA saying, I'm interested in having my piece of equipment um, designated as one of these types of methods um, for this particular pollutant. They have to go through a number of different steps to do this. Um, they send their applications to EPA's Office of Research and Development. And um, we review the applications. Um, this is a very iter iterative process and it can take, you know, from months to years, depending on how complete and accurate an application is. And um, once we approve an application that is submitted to our federal register, so it's announced publicly and um, it becomes a method, it's um, given an ID, a specific ID, um, stating what, what it is, it's either an equivalent or reference method. And then that's something that can be used for compliance purposes. So it's a long process, but um, that's the one that we use. Again, we have to make sure that these instruments are going through very strict protocols, testing protocols, very rigorous protocols to make sure that the measurements that they're giving us can be used for compliance purposes and air quality management strategies and things of that nature. Great. I'm just going to open the floor for anyone who wants to ask questions or share out a little bit. <clears throat> Has anyone attempted to um, use a federal reference method in, in monitoring um, for a local community question or um, environmental question? It, did it look like Gretchen was trying to say something, but her, she was muted? Oh, sorry. Yeah, watch for the mute. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> um, I I just want to ask if um, if anyone had an idea of what the like acceptance rate um, was for people who were proposing their methods uh, to become federal equivalent methods and those that are actually um, approved to be so. Any ideas? I, I personally don't have those statistics um, available. Um, you know, it's the number of applications we get can vary, can be a few a year to, you know, over 20 a year. It just depends on um, a company if they're interested in having their um, application uh, reviewed. But normally, um, you know, if everything is complete, they do um, get approved by EPA and become the official uh, method and whatnot. And there is a list. Um, I just see something in the chat. There's a list of, of methods and they're published, um, or updated every um, twice a year about. So um, you can see the current list of methods that are available to monitor criteria pollutants. Is it the same process for, um, uh, for non-criteria pollutants, for you know, hazardous air pollutants or um, any of the, um, can't remember exactly what the term is called, but like sort of the basically like the criteria pollutants of water. Um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not familiar with that side, so I'm hoping somebody else could chime in on that. Do you want me to talk about water? Sure. Um, hey. Introduce yourself. I think we missed you. Right. Uh, my name is Scott and I work for the Gulf Restoration Network and I guess our experience in using uh, federal reference methods for water and wetlands. I mean we, um, I guess we fly over the Gulf of Mexico and we see oil sheens and uh, I uh, there are narrative criteria for water. I think water in many ways is easier than air because the narrative criteria just established that if you see a plume, and especially if that plume is obviously connected to a point source, 
which is then connected to a responsible party. Um, I mean, you, you can call the National Response Center um, and report it um, by identifying what color the oil sheen is um, according to the NOAA uh, aerial observation of oil sheens uh, method that they've developed with the Coast Guard. Um, so, uh, but, uh, each state also has narrative criteria for water quality and it can be, um, just very qualitative, just, uh, is there, I can't remember what Louisiana's are off the top of my head, but when we reported on that coal terminal, it was just that, you know, is there visible, um, stuff on the water? You know, just, there was black plumes on the Mississippi river. And that satisfied um, the narrative criteria for being reportable and uh, a problem. I'm sorry, I forget the precise language though. <laughs> I think often we, you know, we've encountered problems that, you know, We'll, we'll find an oil sheen in Breton Sound, Louisiana, where there's tons of pipelines and tons of wells, and there's a leak. We take a picture of it, we geocode it, we, we, you know, we, we say it's, it's this, this, we estimate a volume based on NOAA's method, but uh, then uh, the, we found that not, there won't be a response unless the company agrees that there is also a problem. Because we've reported things in the past through the national response system that's that's mostly Coast Guard uh, and DEQ, and then you know uh, DEQ will call the company and say, "Hey, is it, do you have an oil leak?" And they will say, "No." And our report and our picture and our photograph, which contains an oil sheet, you know, that, there's evidence. But because the company says that they're not, they don't have a problem. They're uh, there won't be a response to the oil oil leak. Mm -hmm. Can somebody, I was just thinking about this, can somebody explain the difference between a federal reference methods and a federal equivalence, mm -hmm. the, the equivalence one? Yes, um, so the federal reference, these are designated methods. So for each of the criteria pollutants, this is the method that's used to measure that pollutant. And for the equivalent methods, uh, those are allowing for innovation and in measurement technology. So the method may be different from the reference method, that FRM, um, but they're alternate, alternate technologies that meet all the requirements and testing protocols that are laid out um, that they need to meet, um, but they provide the same type of measurement as a federal reference measurement. Does. Gotcha, thanks. Both of those can be used for monitoring, so um, it's just up to a, a state or local environmental monitoring agency which one that they'd like to treat, choose, as long as it's on that list of, of um, approved and designated methods. Can I chime in just really quickly? Um, sure, Brian. Yeah, you know, you were talking about the FRMs and the FEMs, and the FRMs have always just been like, you know, holy grail, I guess, like the boss is like, you know, nothing that like a small organization or let alone like some random you know community member frms are oftentimes in my experience or my understanding kind of outside the realm of really real possibility and then you see it's almost like we're kind of talking about the femz as like a more you know realistic thing and but a lot of the femz that i've seen are also very high tech and the, the innovation you know we, we talk about those uh, ground level multi-point Flares, you know, that, that was kind of an FEM, right? Um, and so I, I guess I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, you know, in tune with the conversation is that are we, are we talking about those things or are we really doing with what I think Public Lab has been championing for a long time now, a really kind of lower tech technology? Not kind of, so, I mean, can anyone, maybe the question is this, can anyone give me an FEM example of like a low technology? Um, I can I can address that. So this is David Mack, um, and the short answer is no. There there is a no, there is there is no cheap solution for for an FEM. So I mean, so a good example of the FRM versus the FEM 
would be the uh, particulate matter monitors. So the federal reference method for the particulate matter monitoring is usually a, a 24 hour sample that's mm -hmm. captured on a filter. And you know, you weigh the filter before and after and EPA considers that the gold standard of, of measuring particulate matter because um, it's actually a gravimetric um, measurement. The problem is, is it takes like days to get the, get the result and you get one number per day, which is, uh, which is good for the standard because the standard's like a, you look at my table here, it's like a two or a three year average, you know, for a long term uh, exposure over a general population, um, which is what the EPA is all about on a, on a national level. Um, but, you know, states, locals, um, tribes, you know, they want more information on an hourly or, you know, daily basis. So mm -hmm. then we have the federal mm -hmm. equivalent mm -hmm. method, mm -hmm. which are going to give you real time numbers. Mm -hmm. And those, those are the numbers you'll see online. Um, but when it comes to actually, you know, designating a state in attainment or out of attainment, you know, we go back to the filter method. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, when, when I see um, groups outside of the state, local, EPA, you know, attempting to replicate the federal reference methods, you know, I, I usually kind of ask like, well, why are you doing that? Um, Cause I, you know, so I mean, the method is, is one thing. And then there's your kind of like your field and sampling protocols and quality assurance. And then even, even greater than that is like your sampling plan and you know, exactly what you're trying to, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to prove or disprove. Um, so you really have to look at the whole picture and you know, so so the equivalent method or reference method is really just like one specific test um, of what you're trying to measure. So it's, so it's not it's not going to work for everything. I know some people call it, you know, I just call it the gold standard. It's the gold standard for EPA and making determ designations. But you know, if you're trying to you know in, do indoor air quality sampling or to sample outside of your house, it, it very very likely is not you know the right method to use. Yeah, no, Dave, I, I agree with you completely. And I think um, you know, that, that's kind of my point. Um, I just want to make sure I'm in, having the same conversation that everyone else that we're all here to have. But like, yeah, the FRM is like, you no, know, I know it's like the, the, the gold standard, as you mentioned. Um, um, you know, we've spent, uh, you know, uh, Liz and, and I were in North Carolina a year ago or so at, talking about citizen science. And I bought a poster really talking about a project where we spent $100,000 trying to come close to the FRM. Um, and so all the questions that you would ask someone who's replicating it but not doing it are really, are really apt. Um, but I, I guess, I, like I said, my, my whole thing is like understanding that the FRM seems to be unrealistic, unreasonable for community level folk. And I know this, this conversation isn't solely about them. I'll, I'll be honest, that's my focus. Um, and then the FEM seems to be very similar to um, the FRM. I mean, that's, that's how it gets approved, you know, that it has to be literally equivalent in some way. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, when we spend so much time on these, on these, on these, on these regulatory methods and monitors, uh, are we talking about that? But, you know, where does the, the community fit into this, this equation? I, I don't want to sound like a broken record because I know some of you guys have heard me talk about this before. But um, that's my thing, and, and not only, you know, why are they doing it, but how can they do it a certain way to have an impact? And, 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 and I think, you know, I watch, or I try to follow Public Lab close, closely in some of the, like, the really low-tech, robust tools that they continue to develop for folks um, to do something, to gain, to gain some information. Um, but for me, just with some of the regulatory people on, I forget who's actually all on, who was listed in the, in the culture of power, but you know, where is the opportunity for community with their skill set, their expertise level, um, and access to cheap parts? Um, where, where's the, where, where do they fit in in terms of actually influencing things rather than just doing fun science projects? I mean, that, that to me, that's, that's all been my issue. It just seems so patronizing. Hmm. Rochelle, I see you've pinged in here in the chat. Um, I'm going to give you a chance if you're interested on this. Jump in. Or just to address some of Brian's comments. So you're completely right. These FRM, FEM instrumentation, they're extremely expensive. I mean, you're talking easily twenty to forty thousand dollars an instrument. These are high level regulatory grade or research grade types of instruments. So they're not going to be for a community. It's just it's, it's impossible. Um, too much money. 
And that's where those low cost sensors are, are coming about and why the interest in them um, is so strong is because the communities can use them. These are low cost um, techniques that communities can use. It's just that we don't have, um, are still trying to understand these technologies in terms of their performance um, and making sure that the data that we get from them matches what you would with a regulatory or comes near what you would find for a regulatory type of instrument, especially depending on how the data or that, that instrument will be used, um, depending on what, whatever the application is. But um, these are the questions we're trying to answer right now, and it, it is uh, difficult. We need to do more research, and it's definitely important. I'm wondering, um, so something I've been thinking about a lot is, is just that, um, really any of these low cost sensors, even the best performing of them um, are gonna have lower data quality than, than the, the FRMs and FEMs. And that's just to be, I think Matthew's shaking his head, but you can go next. <laughs> um, I think that with most sensors, that is the case because they're very prone to interferences. Any of your optical particulate, um, has a particle monitor, or not passive, but your optical uh, particulate matter monitors are going to be very sensitive to relative humidity um, and also the temperature and all these things. But I'm wondering what, where in the agency um, would be worthwhile to have conversations about, you know, if you can reach a certain, uh, you know, demonstrate a certain uh, data quality or a certain standard, that then that prompts further investigation with these um, more established and more sensitive methods. Like, and where, um, and I know it's not up to ORD, so where in the agency would that kind of advocacy be useful? Is it in the Office of, um, like, Office of Science Policy or um, OAQPS or just where, where, where might that kind of um, advocacy work? Um, I want to ping in. There's a couple people who are um, joining as well. Um, maybe we can start like a, a brief stack here on the chat. So if you're interested in speaking, just put like a, something by your name. Um, but uh, Brandon, um, if you want to say hello and where you're calling in from and maybe your relationship to this call topic as well, I see you pinged in on the chat. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, my name is Brandon Feenstra. I work for South Coast AQMD and work in the Air Quality Sensor Performance Evaluation Center. And it's an evaluation center set up to evaluate the performance of low-cost sensors uh, against reference monitors. So I think that's kind of what the topic is today is low-cost sensors and reference monitors. And uh, much of our information is open to the public. You can check out our website, aqmd.gov backslash aqspec. And the information is there, uh, testing protocols for both lab and field, and results for about 30 sensors. Great. Um, sorry, Gigi, I think you posed a question. Is there someone out there as well um, in terms of where, where in the system these things um, people should be paying in? Is that what? Sorry. Um, I didn't write it. I didn't pose any questions, but I can post the <laughs> website to the no. group chat. I'll put the website on the group chat. Gotcha. Sorry. This person right before you. I am. Um, I just jumped the line here to do a brief intro for you. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh-huh. I can say something about Gretchen's question. This is Allison. Um, I don't have a very specific answer to your question, but it just seem like an opportunity to say, so I mentioned at the beginning that I've been working with Shannon Dozmegan in Public Lab and um, the National Advisory Council for Environmental Policy and Technology on a report that it's called Environmental Protection Belongs to the Public, a Vision for Citizen Science at EPA, and it's going to be coming out on December 13th. Um, and one of the main points in that report, so this is an advisory council asking EPA to do exactly what you're saying to both to sort of recognize a range of data quality tiers or you can call them a variety of different things but essentially think about how things like sensors or citizen science or a lot of additional methods can um, can be useful for things other than the um, the highest gold standard regulation enforcement level and and I think a lot of what this is about is more more the communication and 
sort of all the the ways that community groups and and organizations communicate with EPA. Um, and so a lot of what's in this report is about like feedback loops and how we can think about um, you know people like you mentioned providing data that may not be at the gold standard level but could then provoke a response um, and and further research to maybe get more information about it so I just want to wanted to put that out there and I'll encourage you all to look at the report when it comes out so I think that's one way is for advisory groups to you know approach EPA with with these ideas um, and it's happening it is like it's definitely being talked about I think throughout EPA maybe Rochelle can talk a little bit more about that but it's definitely known that this is an issue um, and so I think yeah there's a lot of different ways that 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 kind of advocacy can can help great and Brian I see you pinged in with a hand up in the chat do you want to go ahead oh sure sure like set up when I'm, when I'm talking to but, um, you know, Can you speak up a little bit? We're having a hard time hearing you just a little bit. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I just wanted to kind of follow up to what I was saying about the FRMs. And it, I mean, it's not even just the FRMs themselves. I mean, like the, the, the rigorous data analysis that goes into it after the data is even gathered, that's a whole nother layer of like barrier to like regular folks trying to, you know, um, we're talking about the tools. What about like the data analysis skill set you need to, you know, be on that that level? I think that, you know, when I've done co-locations with, you know, a couple of the, the tools that we have in the office here, you know, this is a dust trap. This is kind of a particulate matter uh, monitor here, you know, a real time. Um, and I wanted to see how well it correlated with the FRMs uh, down at Clinton Park, Clinton Drive. Um, but then, you know, just the, the, the lead time or the lag time of like once the, even the data is gathered, you know, heaven forbid they come out quickly and tell you what it is. They have to make sure that if there is a problem, they, you know, found a way to ensure that it's real rather than, you know, some type of instrument malfunction. But I guess this, this is I guess this is kind of my point with I just I, I, I don't know how to articulate it, but I, I'm uncomfortable with like creating buying into this dichotomy like kind of entering into this dichotomy of like oh we need a threshold i mean gresham i hear you like i get that i just i just don't think that it's it's a level playing field here and i don't think that um i get that epa is a regulatory agency this is let me put it to you this way like there will be no instrument better at telling me if something's wrong than the human body personally you know what I mean? And I think that we can continue to find metrics and find instruments with low resolution, high resolution, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, at what point do we put the experience of people and their bodies for generations on the same level with our test tubes and our, and our rulers? That, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of my, my, my frustration, I guess, with this all is that we're literally trying to, instead of saying we have to figure out how regulation comes down to the people who literally pay the bills it's like how do people raise their expertise to or what you know this threshold if you will so I, for me that's the cognitive dissonance that I'm dealing with right now with kind of this conversation can, can I can I address that so this is this is David Mack so I think you know part of part of the reason you can understand how the FRMs and FEMs came to be is is you know what they're measuring so they're comparing against the, what we call the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And, um, you know, so EPA um, sets these standards, but, you know, the information generally comes from um, what they call the scientific advisory councils. So in their, their boards that are made up of, um, you know, people who spend their whole life researching public health, epidemiology, um, air quality exposures. And um, it, so there's a huge, and they take this, you know, international, um, you know, body of knowledge through, 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 through the research. Um, <coughs> you know, universities all over the world. And, and they come up with these standards and make recommendations to EPA. And then as a policy decision, EPA decides to adopt them or not. So, but when you look at the PM standards, you know, they're based on a three year average. So they're looking at these long-term uh, epidemiology type studies. Obviously like most of the community groups are not doing that. You know, you, you're, not, you're not starting today and then three years from now, you're gonna have a number. You know, you, you want something faster than that. So that's why we're kind of talking like apples and oranges between, you know, what the EPA does and, and we, look, we look back to like the 70s and see like how did, how did air quality get better from the 70s to today? And you know, when I say we, it's really a lot of academic research is doing this work. And you know, we're, we're kind of along for the ride and trying to 
trying to update the regulations accordingly. Um, so you so it kind of goes back to really like what do you, what are you trying to do? And um, another place you can look for examples some methods would be like NIOSH, which is uh, the research body of OSHA. So th they look at more short-term exposures, and you know a lot of their a lot of their methods are set up for like industrial exposures, like in the workplace. Um, but but you can kind of adjust them depending for what kind of level you want to look at. Um, but they have a huge huge volume of um, um, of different types of test methods for a variety of things. Can I just add one thing here? Um, I I feel that maybe some of this discussion could. Um, be addressed by realizing how the National MBA air quality um, standards came about and that really EPA was tasked with trying to um, uh, safeguard the health of all US citizens, right? So the best thing that we could do was to try to create some of these um, standards, some of these methods, put out monitors in a lot of different places and we're trying to monitor the air quality of the whole US because we're trying to safeguard the health of the whole US. Um, so I think that that's really important to know where these things came from. Now you say, well, they don't necessarily help communities. And that's true because they weren't actually developed to do that. So right now, actually, what we're having is we're playing catch up, right? We're trying to safeguard the whole US. We've made a lot of progress there. And we've learned and we've done that using these methods. But now we're trying to um, target more specific community-based issues and that's just not going to be able to be done with the same sort of technology and that's what you're seeing you you say what i need now is something that i can use in my community that's low cost we can put out a lot of these things we realize that these are not the same but we do need to make sure that when we create these smaller low cost sensors that can go into communities that they do agree well with the technology we've been using before Absolutely, uh, and, and David, I appreciate your comments. Um, uh, you're absolutely right, and, I, and please don't mistake, you know, my my level of understanding of some of these things. I, I just am like determined and dedicated to this this point of view of this this dichotomy that we're buying into. No, I get it. I mean, at the end of the day, these these academics who have helped us get to this point have been. I don't want to say they've been wrong. I get I get in trouble in the office all the time about you know they weren't wrong. We just better understand the levels that we need to be at. Um, and so I would ask, you know, you, Dave, that, okay, so what you're saying is so, you know, and that's the thing is like academics put things forth, but then policy needs to be developed. And I think, unfortunately, that's when things get a little bit wonky. Um, you know, you know, I would, maybe, maybe I could ask you this, David, do you feel like the, the World Health Organization levels, that healthy levels are, something that we should adopt as a country or, um, you know, they're, they're too strict, you know, that, that's one point. And the second thing I was going to say is that, you know, to, to your point, this comments, you know, about, you know, this system was designed to protect the, the country as a whole. Um, you know, I don't want to say that's overly idealistic because um, I think it, it's, it's, it's almost like when this country was established and it was like, you know, free men and free women, you know, but at the same time, it really wasn't for all free men and free women. You know? Mm -hmm. um, because it just even in the beginning it, you know there was large populations and sacrifice zones that's always kind of been a part of it and so yeah we're playing catch up but that's the whole thing is we need to lead and and so do we just wait for the science to catch up or you know again I'm, I know I'm, I might be rambling a little bit but you know those are those are kind of some of my my, my initial reactions to what you, what you both were saying um, I, I want to ping in a point that um, A. Clemens brought in a little bit about the OSHA standards and, and just in, I've, I've been thinking about this a little bit recently, how do people deal with um, when you have, okay, there's like the different standards basically for different places um, by different governing bodies. So is there any way to sort of basically say, you know, this regardless of the monitoring method, or maybe also with the monitoring method, um, these, this particular place is in violation of OSHA, but yet we're, we're also talking about people who live right next to those facilities. And some of these things that we're talking about, specifically like the particulate matter and things like that, these things don't know boundaries of, <laughs> of workplaces. And those who live on the, you know, the outsides of those buildings don't 
you know, they spent two thirds or more of their day in that place potentially versus like the, the OSHA protected groups that are spending a quarter, you know, a third of their day in the workplace. So I guess I'm just kind of wondering like, are there, are there methods used for monitoring based on OSHA? Um, then are those translatable at all into like federal equivalents? Um, and that, that'll protect communities in some of these questions. It's just dead silence, but um, I'll uh, I'll try and address some of that um, because I brought up OSHA. So I mean, the OSHA standards are, are really for occupational work. I, I you know I just mentioned the methods that are sometimes uh, carried over for industrial hygiene and and uh, fence line monitoring and things like that because they're because they're based on shorter term um, results. Um, so and it, and, back, and kind of back to Gretchen's point of you know does does EPA have um, you know stuff in the pipeline as far as creating shorter term standards or, or different methods to do these types type of work. Um, you know, there's always discussions about those things. We don't really have, um, it's not like a bureaucrat now, but we don't really have a regulatory framework to, to enforce that. So the National Ambient Air Quality Standards and everything else we've been talking about, you know, was set forth by Congress in the 1990 Clean Air Act. So that's pretty much what drives our work and gives us, gives the agency the authority to do what it does, um, to set short term limits and create a whole nother body of, um, of methods would, would really require like a, a, a different law, in my opinion. Um, but it's not to say that people can't do that. I mean, consultants um, in different advocacy groups all the time go out and take measurements and make, you know, very convincing arguments that what is happening is not safe and it's not healthy. And um, to that point, I think, you know, the EPA kind of questions how, how can it play a helpful role? You kind of have to be careful what you ask for that, you know, I, I don't think if the EPA came out and said, but well, we think you should use this method to determine particulate matter exposures on a short-term level and just left it at that, that would be very helpful because then I think probably at least 80% of the, I don't know, people out there would say, well, we don't want to use that method. We want to use a different method. So there's no, there's no like clear answer. And I, and I know that's hard um, that, you know, we like to be able to see things in black and white and, you know, are we over the limit or under the limit? But, um, it, it, you know, it's just not how, it's just the, the, the health effects just aren't that straightforward. Can I just well, again, you know, I, I think David, you're 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 right on, and I think you know, all all of the things that we have, you know, and even in the '90s with the, these laws that you know, kind of brought forth through advocacy and like people kind of demanding things get better and things should change. I don't know if it was all a lot of this stuff isn't like oh the goodness of their heart. It's like we want to do it, and so I'm I'm curious, you know, as we as we kind of talk about the, the future in some of these these areas. You know, where we with the whole co-pollutant thing, the kind of the, you know, things in combination, and that's one area that um, I guess I don't see enough movement. I probably, that's probably the case for a lot of these things, enough movement to, to really uh, make me happy or feel good about how soon we can get to this. Um, but I'm, I'm always just curious to know when people think about kind of the, the, the co-pollutant, um, I forget the, the other term of just like the things are interacting with each other. Um, you know, like the threshold for this is this, the threshold for this is that, but together, actually the thresholds for both need to be lower, you know, it's just kind of a rough, rough, rough way of looking at it. So I, I'm curious to see what people think about, you know, even the kind of the co-pollutant thing and, um, and just some of the emerging discussions or, or just ways of, of figuring out a way to, 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 to regulate and enforce it. Um, the cumulative burden is that I think what you're um, referring to. And uh, I think that actually is one of the priorities of the NIEHS right now, um, which is the National Institute of Environmental, um, Environmental Health Science. Um, there was a, a paper out um, that was you know, contributed to by at least 20 probably um, different authors um, about this kind of exposure science and highlighting the need for more cumulative burden um, analyses. And so I know that that's, that's on the docket, but again, like as, as David mentioned too, like epidemiological work is painstaking and long. Um, but, I, but I think you're absolutely right, Brian, that that's, um, that's a huge priority, and, and I, but I think it, it, it is in the, in the pipeline.
you know, I mean, those are the type of questions that, you know, $5 million from the EPA might just scratch the surface on a research grant. They're, 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 big, they're big questions. I mean, we've had some grant recipients come in and, you know, give big presentations like back to back. And, you know, one says that <clears throat> all particular matter is dangerous. And it doesn't really matter what it's comprised of. And then the next group comes up, comes up and says, no, we think that, you know, this composition of PM is 10 times more dangerous than this composition of particular matter. And, you know, and it matters what the, the particles are made of. So, I mean, the verdict's still out and, you know, the EPA, um, you know, funds a lot of research in these, these departments because, you know, the smart people out there in academics, they can figure it out. And it's, it's just really just a hardcore science and not a policy decision. Um, but you can read literature after literature and not really come to conclusion. Um, I was wondering, Brandon, if you could speak for a second a little bit about the experience that you guys have had in terms of trying to get some of your methods on the federal equivalents and what, what has that been like? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, so our, the purpose of our program is not actually to certify or to make a low cost sensor a reference monitor or to um, get it certified by EPA or by AQMD. The purpose is to evaluate the low cost technology, provide um, clarity to the evolving field. It's a, it's a very evolving field at this time. There's a lot of new technology coming out and new products being released. And we've even seen you can have the identical raw sensor and you have three different developers that put it in different um, communication boards and different um, algorithms for calibration. And you're getting drastically different results from these sensors. And so we're trying to provide clarity in this evolving um, low cost sensor field. And we do that by evaluating the sensors, providing the results on our website, um, putting those in tables that are easy to look at so that researchers, whether they be academics, whether they be citizen scientists, whether it is just an interested individual saying, I'd like to know what my air quality is at my house. Should I have my windows open? Should I have them closed? Is it better outside, inside? They can find a sensor that will hopefully fit their needs for a reasonable cost and be able to implement that in their own home. And AQMD is taking on even bigger parts of this project. We have a couple of sensor deployments and we are planning to deploy in about six environmental justice locations in the following year. And as well, so we're very interested in this technology and then also not only how it evaluates to FRMs, but how can it be used to provide actionable insights to the community. And the point of it is not to get, to have something become a reference method. It's to how good is it and can it be used for the application that we're looking for. And that's what we're hoping for is that, you know, and then get the hands, get this technology out into the communities. And that's also probably a barrier too, is how do we do it? How do we do it correctly? And I know to kind of go on one of the questions is the large data analysis behind this. That is one of the huge questions that comes in with low cost sensors. And it's going to be to a point where there's going to be so many low cost sensors out there that there's needs to be automatic quality control, quality assurance parameters that are built into a cloud-based application that is able to ingest all this data and basically provide the algorithms, provide the data filtering so that if you have a special event somewhere, that data is not going to affect um, the actual sensor readings or if you have it all displayed on a map. So that's, that's, those are things that AQMD is looking at and we're hoping to come out with better information in the future, especially with, uh, we have EPA star grant. That's where the environmental justice locations will be um, getting sensors out in those locations. And part of that's gonna be building a back end data analytics to be able to handle that data. And I don't wanna to talk too much, but that's about it, unless there's any other kind of further questions on what we're doing at AQMD. Yeah, we're um, just a quick ping back in here. Um, so we do try to keep open hour um, to an hour, uh, just in terms of making sure that everyone can get back to whatever they need to get back to. Um, so I, but I want to, I always leave the line open, but um, I want to make sure just to thank everyone who has taken time to um, share with everyone else here today. Um, it's really great to be able to share in a, in a space together about all these questions and ideas that were floating around. Um, and I encourage anyone who's been in 
inspired um, by people on the call today to you know reach out on the public web list or on online about some of these questions that we're all floating around or about some of these ideas that we're all floating around. Um, but I just you know, want to say thank you. It's, it's, we're about at the hour, but I will leave the line open um, to carry on the conversation for anyone interested in sticking, sticking around and, and talking. I just wanted to follow up on um, what Brian was just talking about. So currently, um, we have had some interest from sensor manufacturers in getting their instruments um, FEM certified but we're not currently accepting any applications of that nature. And it's because the way the regulations are set up, they're more for regulatory purposes. And there are things that a sensor device currently, uh, most of those that are out there, they cannot, you can't test um, those devices because of that. So for example, um, there's a lot that we don't know about how a sensor performs on day one, um, when it's you know set to, um, the person who wants to use it versus day 365, is the measurement going to be the same? Um, is there anything that's going to be replaced? Um, how can we make sure or calibrate those instruments to make sure that every day those measurements are giving us a consistent measurement? Um, there's, there's, there are things that we can't um, handle with that. So there's no way that the way the current structure is set up for the regulatory framework that we can um, evaluate these types of instruments. That being said, EPA is looking into possibly doing a, a different certification program for these devices. This is um, a continuous uh, discussion right now. Um, a lot of it has to do with resources, who's going to do it. These kind of programs are very expensive. So there are things that um, are being discussed right now. So it is on the table. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are interested in it. So, you know, it's important for us to look into this. Julia, I see you have a question on here in the chat. Do you want to go ahead? You're muted. <laughs> oh, you can't. Can you not speak? Okay. Oh. There's a baby. So oh, sorry. No, that's okay. No, no. Um, so it, someone from AQD um, was talking about the back end analytics. I was wondering if that was in process, that, that people had been messing around with that with regards to the uh, the sensors? Yeah, that is uh, definitely something we're looking into. And this is Brandon from AQMD. And I know EPA has looked into this. I think they have like Retigo, R E T I G O. They have a couple other things. And uh, we're working with Sonoma Technology Institute. We're also having conversations with uh, Microsoft, uh, Google, and Amazon Web Services. And, Trying to figure out what it's going to take to build something like this, what it's going to look like, what's going to be the architecture, and you can get into so many details on even just cloud architecture. Where's our storage going to be? How's the data pipeline into our analytics engine going to look like? And what's going to be our initial filters? So there's a lot to be discussed, and but it's definitely something that we're looking into, and I'm hoping that AQMD is going to make a decision on um, getting started on building this. So and having a request for proposal to go out fairly soon on on building something to actually take in mostly the sensor data that we produce in our own district but even with the higher goal of taking in data from possibly citizens or you know and even people are throwing out the idea hey why don't we start a library at uh, AQMD where we can have citizens come in actually check out a sensor like you would a book and then take that out to their home and, but that sensor is something that we have control over we calibrate it we make sure it's a uh, working well. So there's a lot of different things bouncing back and forth. I'm going to see a lot of this field changing in the next, you know, 12 months to 24 months. Thank you. Rachel, um, I'd love to hear about this link you added to the chat. Um, Ms. Rochelle, uh, this is the ReadyGo website. So this is a data visualizer so communities can upload data that they collect from sensors. And this will display the data in maps. Um, and figures, and you can um, observe your data in that way. Just a tool to help with, um, you know, the challenges of knowing that communities may not necessarily um, be equipped with knowing how to analyze this type of data. So these are tools to, to facilitate that. One feature I think is really cool in Redigo is that um, 
you can analyze like, you know, um, you can plot your data. So it's, you know, your concentration versus distance, but the distance isn't necessarily from a single point. You can do it like so that it, uh, you know, they have a, the spine of a road. Um, you can look at, you know, you know the, dis the distance from that road, even if that road changes. Um, and so I think that's, I, know, I thought it was really cool, <laughs> uh, very useful. I was wondering, can that be used uh, internationally? I think it can be used for anything at this point right now. Does anybody interested in looking and exploring their data um, can use this the free tool available online? Yeah, you can just upload a, um, a CSV, I think. <clears throat> That's really cool. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, that is, uh, this is Scott, that is really cool. Um, I think a uh, question I had earlier, uh, you know, just, just trying to, you know, listening to what Brian is saying and agreeing with everything about it and trying to find out where the, the national, you know, EPA is like kind of way up here at the national scale and those of us on the ground are like way down here at a totally different scale. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm always thinking about how, you know, it, when we have these problems with air pollution, or again, I'm mostly in water, so I'm thinking about water, but mostly we're, we're talking about companies and the companies are all, always going to talk to the government through lawyers. And so we're also, when we can, uh, trying to talk to the government through lawyers just to compete with the amount of biologists they have and the amount of lawyers they have. Um, and I, I just worry that, I mean, I love national standards, but in the past when we did some air monitoring around a coal pile, um, you know, we got some bad readings that were, you know, um, they were bad by EPA standards. I mean, they were good by EPA standards, but they were bad by WHO standards. But it, it, you know, the 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 scale mattered a hell of a lot, and I feel like those national standards are for for much bigger things. Are there any disclaimers in the national standards? Is like you can't use these if the scale of your project is smaller than like a town because I mean that's what happens is you get to court and they're experts saying this dust isn't a problem and you're you have to hire an expert and hire a lawyer and do all this stuff to say no it is a problem and then you got this battle of standards so is there anything written into the national standards to like place it in context so we don't have to fight the standards in court mm. Or maybe there's not, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe there's anything like that. But one thing with this low cost sensor world is that we're trying to work on communicating what those measurements mean to people and how, you know, what you're reading on an instrument, this one minute average or a five minute average, how that relates to the standards that are set on a completely different time scale, 24 hours, it could be. Um, whatever it is, one hour, um, how to um, communicate to people what that means so that they're not, you know, in a panic because, you know, they're seeing these really high values. Um, so that's something that's continuing to be um, on the agenda here. I also wanted to just say um, to that point, um, you know, about those lawyers is like, you know, we're all talking through lawyers and everything. And, and thank God for like, Earth Justice and EIP in our in our, our legal arms in this all. Um, but but I mean, to your point, um, who, is, is there anyone who's like focused on this, like a legal entity who's like we at the national level want to work on this? That that I'm not sure about because I, I feel like on the other side of the, the table, if you will, um, there are those who are like focused on 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 this issue and so but i'm wondering on, on on some of the green side of things you know is there any legal bodies who are like focused on this issue i mean public lab is certainly you know what i mean or, there's a lot of organizations are certainly but like is there any legal 
entities who are like focused on this versus this is kind of like a, a peripheral, you know, if it, if it connects to something else that they're working on, then so be it. But I, I, I don't know if I'm not aware of anything where someone is really saying that we want to move this conversation forward. I think that's maybe hope my passion doesn't come across uh, the wrong way, but you know, it's, it's like, you know, this is all a conversation and, and we got to move it forward. And it's, you know, people reminding folks what kind of the, the, the bottom line is. And, and you also missing something that, that resonated with me. You're talking about like a national thing and certainly like climate change and ozone and things like that happen very regionally. But last time I checked, like air pollution tends to be primarily like a localized issue. Mm. Um, and I mean, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I, I can be very narrow minded at times. And so like, but like, pollution from what I gather tends to be very localized. And so, you know, shouldn't we kind of be looking at it at least that if we're, if we're going to choose a national or a, a lo local, I mean, but again, it's kind of been set up and we're kind of inheriting uh, a situation, but you're just kind of thinking out loud here. Um, it's, it's really not just a local issue. I mean, <clears throat> there's a huge debate as to, you know, who causes what, but Specifically with ozone, uh, there's the transport issue. So it goes all the way from the Midwest states to the Northeast corridor. Um, and that's gone to the Supreme Court a couple times, you know, debating how much power plants in the Midwest contribute to ozone in New York City. And really how much is it the cars in New York City that are contributing to the ozone in, say, like Connecticut. Um, and it, it, it's just kind of this goofy argument of like, well, who was the, who was the person who put us over the edge into the unhealthy? You know, you know if, if this, you say, 80 parts per, parts per billion, you know. Well, you know, Pennsylvania might say we only contributed 10 of those, so you'd be at 10 if, if it wasn't for your 70 or whatnot. Um, so this is debate that continues. Where, where, where does it start and where does it end? Um, I think what I've seen from most of the community, sci uh, community scientists, it, it, it is more of like a local, um, like they can see the source just because that's what they're facing like in their, in their life. So they might be do more of like a fence line perimeter type, type uh, study, which is, which is a lot different from what, what we do for like, you know, national monitoring. So I, I guess the short answer is it, it can be either. It, it can be a, a transport issue or it can be a, a very acute, um, you know, short, uh, short transport kind of effect. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that dynamic that you're talking about that I agree with completely, it's always, it's, it's, it's good. You guys chime in and tell me if I'm, if I'm not looking at this right. Because again, I, without you all, I, I'll be out of my mind. But um, like, big, like once we solve it locally, don't we solve it nationally? Like, is that, is that like not make, is that, does that, I mean, and again, I know we've inherited this. I get it. We're, we're all, we are where we are, but if, you know, at, at what point do we consider stepping back and being like, okay, well maybe, you know, we're, we're buying into this and we need to kind of re reevaluate. I'm not trying to, you know, break the system down or anything like that. I'm, I'm just, you know, kind of throwing these things out here just because I just feel like to a certain extent, if we solve the local issue, wherever it is, like it doesn't become much of a who you know who did what and how much is whose fault. It's like we all locally are, you know, getting a handle on the pollution. You know, again, you're at, you're at the EPA. You're seeing this stuff at a, at a larger vantage um, for miles up in the air. Um, I'm looking at it very very local. I'm in Houston, Texas, petrochemical capital of America, and um, you know, I'm looking at Manchester. Deer Park, the chip channel, the trains, the trucks, you know, like real stuff, real impacts. And I, and, you know, and I hear all these different things like, well, Brian, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to this. And I'm just like, well, if we fix it here and you fix it there and they fix it there and they fix it here, doesn't then that solve kind of this bigger issue? I have to say, if that's, if you're looking mostly at you know humans contributing, but there's also anthropogenic, you know, uh, excuse me, um, natural sources. You know, there's um, biogenic types of sources. There's different things going on. There's weather, you know, um, and like uh, for example, we're doing a study in Utah. They have terrible PM there, and it just has to do with um, weather inversions. You know, um, winter time. Uh, they're just really high levels of PM during those times. Um, <coughs> So, you know, it's a mix of different things that are going on. And, you know, there's also um, uh, transport from around the world that affects 
our air quality here, you know, dust storms from China, uh, those kind of things. So I think there's a lot of other things other than what we're doing that contributes to uh, air quality issues, making it not just, you know, local issue. I think it's going to be around. So yeah. um, we're always going to have problems with it. Fires as well. <laughs> what was that? I, I was saying, you know, and then heaven forbid we talk about wildfires, you know what I mean? Like who's, who's, who's the blame for wildfires, you know, and all the, the, the ash and sit that gets put, but you know, I, I don't know. I, I get, I'm not talking about any of that. Like mother nature does her thing. I think if we left it to just mother nature to create issues, we wouldn't I don't know if we'd necessarily be dealing with some of the stuff that we're really dealing with. Um, I think we're talking about more like artificial unnatural natural um, pollution, if, if that makes sense. Cause I mean, we all drove our cars. So that's it's not unnatural because we're all doing it. But I'm not talking about any of that. I, and I recognize that. But I, I wonder if that's kind of like the exception to the rule. And I, I want to focus on, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the Pope here and talking to you guys about some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that, that's I just sometimes I wonder, I'm like, if we can fix some of these things locally, it kind of solves the bigger issue. Um, and uh, to, but to your point, you know, you've got you've got boats traveling, you've got you know, ozone, like you said, Dave, that's a, a very much a regional issue and things can carry far. I mean, you know, Houston was just barely in attainment for their PM, um, you know, uh, regular uh, attainment after getting a, a large data set taken out to then become an attainment. And I think it was like 11.9 at that point. Um, but there was apparently some fires in, there was, a, there was Saharan dust. And I think there was a fire from Mexico. And with those two impacts to, the, to that three-year average taken out, then the area came into marginal attainment of the, the, the modern, uh, you know, and I try not to be a, a skeptic or a cynic or, a, you know, but it's just, you know, I, I, think, I think, Dave, that's the thing. It's, it, there's all this, it, we create all this complexity, um, and I think it kind of opens up for some, some, for some really smart people to to really take advantage of it and, and like i guess i try not to be too cynical um but it, that that to a certain extent is kind of how what i feel like i've been seeing well we are at 117 um at my time <laughs> i don't know where it is your time <laughs> um <clears throat> But does anybody else have anything um, we'd like to share out? Um, I've, there have been some really great helpful resources put in the chat, and I will work to collect all of those uh, from the call and post them below the open hour um, so people can link back to them. Um, also, you know, to reiterate, if, if there have been some good questions or information shared, um, to, to get it up in, on Public Lab where people can learn about the things that we know or know about or have been talking about. Um, but anything, anything else before we, um, before we go? We have a lot of great people in the room, so. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was really interested in one of the possible topics we could have talked about on the call, um, about um, how new methods can, uh, become certified or become the reference methods. And I'm not sure if we have anyone else on here who wants to speak to that, but um, I was interested. <clears throat> I, I dropped in a couple of links a little while ago into our chat uh, when Brian was talking, because I know the, the machine that um, Houston Airlines had used was a mini ball monitor, um, which has uh, I linked to their their page of, of studies and of the equivalence of that technology to federal reference methods, and um, so this this gets into that question of how do things get approved because the science is really quite excellent um, around its equivalence. Uh, it is approved as an equivalent method here in Oregon uh, and is used for uh, monitoring wildfire uh, particulate matter and field burning particulate matter, especially in rural areas. But it hasn't moved in to the, the, uh, into being a federal method. And so I was interested in how that works. You know, when the science is there, and it's not a super low cost method, there's still like $2,000 machines, they still cost you know, quite a bit per sample to run. But it's a filter-based system, similar to the FRMs. It's got a lot of technological equivalents. And um, 
and a really good scientific track record. And so I was wondering where technologies like that get caught up, why they don't end up necessarily in the federal reference methods, or if this technology had been looked at and kind of passed over. It's just, um, just to revisit some of the technical aspects of that monitoring, because you know, in, in the case with Houston Air Alliance, uh, their technology, their, their monitoring was kind of rejected out of hand uh, by the local region office, just saying, well, that's not FRM, we don't have to look at it, you know? And um, I know that a lot of folks are, are working to take steps that that doesn't happen in the future, but, you know. So um, normally for, for the, the reference and equivalent method program, a company has to submit, they have to do all the testing, they have to submit the application, get everything together, very expensive so um, the company actually has to take the initiative to do that uh, so if you haven't seen it um, on the list maybe that hasn't happened yet um, and it depends on the technologies again some of these sensor technologies those current regulations just can't handle them and we have no no way around it we can't change the regulations right now that takes just as long you know as some of the other things but um, where it stands right now. So again, it's the company's responsibility or they make the decision because they have to put the resources in to prepare their application, to run all the necessary tests um, and what have you. So um, that just, it just depends. Hmm. So I, actually, can you clarify? Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I was and just wondering. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. EPA is looking at um, maybe some alternate ways that we can approach these sensors in terms of getting them somewhat certified um, and have something, some kind of framework set up um, so that people can use these uh, communities, uh, what have you. My question. Oh, sorry, sorry, Stevie. Um, I was going to ask is that along the same lines as the report Allison says is about to come out? Or is this another another um, bit of work? I, I think this is uh, a little bit different from what she's doing. I think they're more working on uh, messaging for communities and providing community <coughs> information, um, whereas this would be providing, um, you know, sensor manufacturers another tool or a, a possible way to, to have their instruments certified some way or another. Wow. Um. My question was, does it actually, does it have to come from the company? Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. They're responsible for paying for the testing and putting the applications together. They have to develop user manuals. Um, they have to follow all the protocol that's laid out um, for testing these types of instruments. So this is why you don't see, you know, 5,000, you know, a whole lot of instruments on that list because it takes time uh, for testing and money, resources. Liz, you, I see a hand. <laughs> uh, thanks. Yes, I'm wondering, could you direct us to um, the list of requirements? Um, uh, we'd like to share them with some of the small companies and um, other organizations that work to develop hardware and protocols and user manuals um, uh, in and in and beyond public lab. Uh, just a quick clarifying question: uh, is, Was it that uh, the the company must submit, or uh, typically the company is the only one who's able to raise money to do it? Like, for example, could a third party identify a commercially available instrument uh, and then pay for the testing and the and so forth to get that pushed through, even if they didn't originally develop it, uh, the, the actual hardware? Yeah, I think it's, it's normally the company that submits and they, they just fund it however they fund it. That's not up to us. And they just have to submit an application. We're just reviewing the application. We can't tell them how to go about um, you know, oh. raising funds to do so. Oh, sure. I, I guess my, my clarification question was, is it specifically that the company must do it or that uh, any, anyone may do it, but the company is typically the only one who has an interest or has done so in the past? Yeah, it's usually a company that has an interest um, in doing it. Um, it. It looks good for them to have their, their instruments listed as a gold standard, so it's good for them, but uh, that's how it typically is handled. Great. 
Thank you. Yeah, I mean, because we've we've talked with a lot of people who are interested in in uh, looking at existing instruments and getting them certified, even if they weren't the original creators. So, thank you very much. That makes, that makes a lot of sense, you know, because I, I mean, I could see, I could see to your point, I could see how someone who, I mean, there's a there's an entire community of folks who like use these. I mean, this is almost like the upgraded bucket bridge. Well, I guess is I guess is that's maybe like a bucket, but. Uh, Danny Larson, she, he's the one who gave us the original technical assistance behind these things and really got us to the best of speed. Um, but no, to your point, I'm, I'm thinking that if I'm using this tool in the way that it's designed, I feel like anyone should be able to, you know, put it forth for testing and, and have it go through the computers to see if it, if it can be set or not. I, I would, it doesn't seem odd to me that the, the company would be the only ones able. They would be the ones that would make more sense. They have access to all the technical documents. They designed it. They could, you know, really, they'd be best positioned to do it. But in the absence of them doing it, I, I just, it, I don't know, it just seems really odd to me that like, oh, no, only the company can do it. They have no interest. No one can do it. That would seem odd to, odd to me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I mean, often I think you might find that a, a, a piece of hardware may have other uses beyond what it was originally specifically designed for, maybe very adjacent, very similar uses, but that the company didn't see a commercial use case for. So I, that's, I, it's a hypothetical, but I, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, just uh, again, anyone can go whenever. <laughs> we're, we're just now, egging on these conversations past the hour so um yeah um, this, this is this is data next so i just wanted to touch go back to touch upon what uh, what brian had said earlier where you know of course these equipment uh, equivalent methods and reference methods um you know they're expensive instruments you 25 thirty thousand dollar instruments sometimes um but oddly enough um it's, it's really still just a fraction of what it costs to run a, a monitoring program if you're going to run a program for say like three or five years um, so you need obviously personnel trained and know how to operate the instruments, do the way the filters, um, do the data analytics, do quality control, um, do audits, uh, calibrate the instruments on a regular basis. Um, you need a site to locate the instrument at, which isn't always so easy. Um, you need power, hopefully internet, um, probably some heat and things like that, air conditioning, depending on where you are. So, so basically what I'm trying to say is it, it quickly adds up. So I, I know a lot of times there's a focus on like proprietary technology as, as the standard. Um, but even at the cost of like $20,000, $30,000 per instrument, um, to run a long-term program, um, the actual cost of the instrument is, I don't want to say neg negligible, but it's quickly, you know, maybe like, <clears throat> you know, a fifth of your budget for the first couple of years or something like that. Um, you know, at, at, at the federal level, if we told the state we'll buy them at instruments and they just have to, you know, do the rest. I mean, they would just laugh at us and say that that's, that's not going to cut it. Like, you know, the, they'll, they'll budget a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars sometimes um, per site uh, per year just to get a just to get a monitor going. Um, you know, based on the shelter and siting requirements and the power hookup and everything. Um, it, so, so um, I guess is what I'm trying to say is you know it's more than just the technology, um, and it's more more than just these companies submitting the applications. Um, it it's the that's just the test method. Um, and the sampling and the quality control and the personnel um, is really what makes the whole program kind of come together. Yeah, Dave, I, I agree. You know, it's funny working out here in Houston with uh, the, one of the major uh, particular matter. Uh, David, whoever's speaking, I can't tell. Can you speak up? Brian. Oh, sorry, Brian. I, I, was just, I was just saying, Dave, you're, you know, I, I, it was, it's been really interesting for me firsthand to kind of see that part of it. I mean, like, like you said, the instrument, and I feel like you're like kind of low, low balling it. I mean, you talk about like the man hours or woman hours and, um, and just all the, the siting, the power, if it's not existing, just like all the stuff that goes in, the, the calibrating. Um, and again, a lot of times we're not even talking about the data analysis that goes into it after the fact, after the data is, after the sample has been pulled. Um, and so, you know, I guess sometimes it, it may seem, it may, for me, it may feel like a contentious conversation like EPA versus community sometimes. Um, and really what I like to do is kind of rotate the conversation to a point where it's like, how does the EPA take advantage of all these people who are engaged and interested in monitoring the air quality in their communities um, and leveraging that to, for the EPA, like the EPA really seeing that in a genuine way as an asset and as an opportunity. I think for me that's like a whole different conversation than 
you guys aren't respecting the data that we're pulling. The EPA, you know, the community saying that to the EPA. You're not, our, 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 it's just some, not, you know, pet project that you're saying, you know, pat me on the back. Oh, good job. You, you did something. You did a, you, you know, because a lot of these people actually kind of already know that something's wrong or feel like something's wrong and are tired of the research. They're, they're trying to see the movement and the changes. You know, it's, it's funny. You got this whole EJ 2020 thing is like making it a visible difference. And I'm like, boy, what if we decrease the pollution? Talk about a, a visible difference. You know what I mean? But yet it's, it's, it's other things than that. And but like I said, I don't want it to be a, a contentious conversation. I, I really want it to be like, how does the EPA, and I know they're, they're actively trying to figure that out. I'm, I don't want to take any credit away from ORD and EJ and, and all the, the great staff of the EPA. Um, but just wanting to always to hear that, 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 conver that conversation in that way of like, how do we literally take advantage of this opportunity of so many people literally on the, on the fence lines all, in these communities? I mean, you know, that's a problem. I think to a large extent, David, is that, you know, we're talking about limited budgets. I mean, we're, how does that factor into this? It's, you know, we try to argue that, oh, we're EPA doing everything that it can. Yeah, but that's not, it's not discount that it only can do that much because of its being hamstrung at times via its budget. Um, you know, like you've got, you got big swaths of the country who are literally calculating the, the level of PM or ozone, whatever, by equations, like literally by just your equations. And I'm not, I'm not minimizing the sophistication and brilliance of those equations, but they're equations. And for me, I'm always nervous when we're using equations rather than like actual readings, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I call it the, the Tom Brady example, which <clears throat> you, you, may, you may be familiar with Tom Brady and that he was accused of cheating. And um, the NFL used two air pressure gauges that cost twenty dollars each, and then the um, they hired a consulting company and paid them one point five million dollars to analyze the data. And that makes me suspicious that you know when you when you invest thirty dollars in your your instruments and one point five million dollars on consultants that you know maybe they're cooking the numbers just slightly. So I mean I, I agree with you that when you when you you, you have to have some um, um, you know a, a fundamental concept of science is uh, is be able to reproduce your results. So you need to have independent sources and, and things like that. In, uh, in Houston, I think they, they, there's an e, there's a, there's a, there's an old coal monitor. I think it's owned by TCEQ. It's managed by the city of Houston. And I think Harris County does some, maybe they have their own piece of equipment over there as well or something. I mean, like talk about confusing um, and just, opportunity for things that kind of, I don't want to say fall through the cracks. I don't, I don't want to say that, but again, just when I've been doing, I've done co-locations with the mini ball, with the dust tract. Um, we, part of the project that I think um, one of the gentlemen was referring to that we did was that we were wondering if the um, migratory monitor was com completely descriptive of the entire area. And we had some concerns about how, you know, Dave, you know, well, as I do that there, the sighting of those sites is, is very, um, in depth and, and rigorous, you know, and, and, but I, there was a site where they started to really do a lot of stuff around the site itself, kind of buffering, if you, if, in my opinion, the results or, or, you know, kind of buffering the site. Um, you know, they paved a lot of the roads right in the area. And, and not to say that those, those were maybe throwing the, the, the readings off, but if you, if you live there, you know, that's, that's, you know, are we going to do that everywhere? You know what I mean? Like how, how do, you know, how do we do it where it's, it's not literally just changing it so that we're the, after we take out those two data sets of the, the Saharan dust and the fires, Mexican fires, we're just barely in, a, in attainment. You know, it's just, um, you know, sometimes that sighting piece, I'm like, you know, it, it, you, there's, there's regulation around sighting and, and you have to maintain the site as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, I, so I, I don't know about this specific situation. I can't, you know, speak to that. But um, but in general, I you know I do know that this this kind of back and forth of a tennis game that happens with with permits and regulations and and um you know following them to what people perceive to be the letter of letter of um, the document, but maybe not to its intent. Um, and that's when you kind of have to take a a step back and just make a judgment call whether whether we're doing <clears throat> whether people are doing the right thing or not. Um. um because even with volumes of regulations, it, it, it's where the lawyers get involved and it's just, 
things can drag on. <laughs> right. You know, how many policies do we have currently in, in court right now? I mean, geez. But, you know, I'll be honest with you, Dave. I've been doing this work for a little while now. And I'm for me, I'm getting like the light bulb is going off. And I'm, I don't know if I'm going crazy or I'm being smart. But, um, you know, like I just it, I've, I've, I've often felt so pit against industry. Um, and I don't think that's right. Um, I don't think that it's industry's job to to make sure that they're playing by the rules, if you will. Um, that's 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 the regulate that's regulators' job. Like like we don't we don't have speed limits on the roads and just wait hope for everyone to just with, by their own good heart to go by the speed limit. Like we literally establish it for the public safety and and there's active enforcement and people literally drive slow in fear of getting a speeding ticket. And so I just feel like we're so, it's like, it's almost a brilliant, like there's a, bu a business is outside of the oil and gas industry, there's a business that is able to find a loophole within the rules to, to even make more money than they already are. Like that's oftentimes considered brilliant. Like they're literally figuring out the, the whole, the, the, the key to the game. The, the, the job of regulation on the other hand is supposed to ensure that that doesn't happen, that everyone is safe. Like, so I always, oh, it's almost like at, at times I felt like, Oh, I need industry to not pollute as much as they they are, and I'm just like, that just seems so backwards. It's like I need regulation to do its job completely. Um, if I could be, if I could speak in broad strokes. Heard. <laughs> Cumulative impacts is never really, there's no one, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like in the law for now. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's, it's just no one doing it. And that's what the government, you think, you know, someone who's just keeping track of everything. So you can assess cumulative impact <clears throat> of one thing. Um, but I think cumulative, yeah, it's just, uh, mm. I think like maybe another thing to keep in mind too is, you know, while we are, we expect <laughs> and hope that um, the government would be the people to say, yes, you know, this is the <clears throat> limit, this is that. This is something to keep in mind that <laughs> we have changing governments all the time and they compete a lot internally in terms about th those exact same things and they should or should not be regulated. So I, I, while I agree with you that it should come from there, like it's not always, we have to rely, we have to force industry to be good actors from just like we're seeing, you know, happen um, <clears throat> recently. And we have to, um, we have to look at other things as well. Although, I think like you're right in in an ideal world we'd all have speed limits on these things and and be able to like identify how someone is or isn't a good actor yeah and it's, it's definitely government's job to do cumulative impacts analysis and it's a job no one is doing I think the public the public lab way of doing things though because we're we're going to be in a new world of getting many people to do science. I mean, that's applicable to, you know, you're going to have to deal with your Congress people who are like non-science based. In fact, they're the opposite. I don't want to say they're ignorance based form of government <laughs> is the Congress, but it's you kind of like, say I didn't say that. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> based on numbers, it's based on how many people care about a thing. It doesn't matter if that thing is a real thing. This matters on numbers of people caring about a thing and how many people are in that person's district or whatever. So, I mean, uh, doing science in a way that includes as many numbers of people as possible, I think is gonna be a good thing just to, so those numbers of people can then turn around and call on their um, other forms of government that are not receptive to evidence or less receptive to evidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, you know, they have a different skill set. You know, there's a lot of scientists would be horrible politicians. There's a lot of politicians would be horrible scientists. And, you know, yeah. we all think about different types of intelligences. You know what I mean? And I think that's yeah. how, how I look at it, you know. And so rather than saying, you know, good or bad, it's just, you know, this is what you're good at. This is what I'm good at. And hopefully we can be experts in those areas. 
and get it all done. You know what I mean? That's that's mm-hmm. kind of I think, the, the, the idea behind it. But you know, they are doing they you know a lot of electeds are they're dealing with a lot of things. They're not just dealing with environment. And so for them to be completely expertise on that specific issue right. is a farce. It is it's really not appreciative of all the other issues that are near and dear to a lot of other people. And you know what I mean? It's like yeah. they've got to be just as up to speed. So. That's what it comes when it comes to electeds. It's their staff. It's it's the folks who are educating them. It's our relationships with those staff people so that they're informed and really make good decisions. I think. <laughs> mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right. Well, now we. I think we officially made this one of the longer open hours <laughs> that we've had open two hours. <laughs> um, but yeah, just thanks again. Um, and these. Let's keep these conversation lines open. So. Um, it's good to share this space, but um, yeah, one forty my time. I, I will leave it open for anyone who has last things to share um, or resources to, to pan out, um, but I think we should call a wrap soon. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks, thanks for joining and sticking around, and it's been awesome. Thank you. Bye. See you next month. Open art. <laughs>